here and then I'm going to um, start to share it over to Facebook. And at this point, we're going to be going live on Facebook and then I'll let everybody in that's okay. in the waiting room. So okay. this will be fun. Thank you so much, guys. This is going to be great. Um, Very cool. Let's see. So I kind of run all these technical aspects behind the scenes here and uh, I've learned, I've had to learn all these, uh, <laughs> you know, aspects of Zoom and Facebook together, which has been fun. Right, yeah. Um, but uh, it's great. So what a different world we live in these days, you know, we live on Zoom. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, once we get this rolling here. Can you so all hear that beeping noise whenever you, when that comes in? Yeah, out? yeah, but, but, well, that's, yeah, I hear that, but also it shows that, um, you know, that, that means that folks are uh, coming in um, to attend, which is great. This is going to be a very well attended event. All right, here we go. We're going live on Facebook here. Nice flag, Gabe. <laughs> I leave it to you, Mike. Thank you, Ann. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. How are you? Uh, I guess not as good as you. I mean, uh, I, I'm doing great, though. Um, glad you could be here. Nice to uh, hear from you. I, I know I can't see you just yet, but. Uh... I can do something about that, but then, you'll, then I'll scare everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, another virtual Smokehouse session uh, tonight with Colonel Malone, which uh, we're thrilled to have on board with us tonight. And um, as always, we're going to um, kind of hang out for about 10 minutes and then we'll kind of get started from there. So it's great to see everybody. Some familiar faces. Looks like some new faces. Uh, let's see. Gary Trexler, I saw uh, you were flying around. You were down in Smith Mountain Lake the other day, huh? Oh, Gary's still muted. Hey, Gabe. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, man. Good. How are you doing? Doing, doing good. <clears throat> well, just trying to, I'm looking over my other screen here. I'm trying to get something situated and it's giving me a little technical issue, but uh, Ryan, uh, how you how you holding up in Colorado, man? <laughs> man, send some heat. It's cold. We had to just turn the furnace on. Is that right? <clears throat> yeah. It's all right. It'll be good. Just got to get that tractor up and running tomorrow. <laughs> I like I liked, I liked the uh, virtual series you have behind you, Ryan. <laughs> That's my girl. I hope she's uh, happy being back in Frederick. I left her at home. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing you did, honestly. Yeah. Um, and so once again, we're having place on, okay, there we go. Um, I think I fixed that rhyme for the dinging noise. So if you, if you hear it again, let me know, but I hear it, but let me know if you do. Um, so anyways, um, let's see who else we have here. We've got uh, Vic Data. What's going on, man? Sorry, on mute. Hey, Gabe, how are you, man? Good. Long time no on. talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can see Chris having his uh, after meal snack over there. How are you doing, Chris? It's before meal and it's... Uh... And <laughs> hey, look, they got some made going on. <laughs> it looks too delicious. I'm going to go grab me some as well. <laughs> oh. oh, hey, Gabe. Sorry, I was on mute before. I didn't realize, but... <laughs> oh, no problem, Gary. How are you doing? Good. I did a whole trip around the uh, southern part of Virginia on Sunday. Hit uh, six different airports for stamps. So. Nice. Very good. How'd you like? Uh, how'd you like Smith Mountain? It was awesome. It was really nice. I did uh, Roanoke, Smith Mountain Lake, Danville, and then three of the other smaller ones to the east. 
Did you get a uh, Farmville on um, Gary? Uh, I've had that one before. So I'm to the point where I, I've only had six stamps left to, to finish my book. Oh, lucky you. You oh, get nice. that nice embroidered <laughs> jacket, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. That's fantastic. So. Um, yeah, Smith Mountain's great. That's where Scott takes his plane. All, he's, he, he goes down there often. So he's there right now, probably, as a matter yeah. of fact. But uh, that's great. Uh, Let's see, Michael McDaniel, how's uh, training going for you and uh, getting getting back into it? Yeah, it's going well. Uh, Good. I've uh, been doing a lot of flying in the Tiger and the um, and the uh, Traveler, and as soon as the Seneca gets back, I'll work. I'll uh, start working on my MEI, and then that'll reinstate my long expired CFI double and give me a new certificate. Good. That's awesome. Good for you. <clears throat> Very cool. Let's see, we've got uh, James Lindsay in the house tonight with us and been flying around the country and <laughs> everything else. So great to see you. See, we've got, there you go. Oh, you went. There we go. Got it. <laughs> <clears throat> Got time for a quick PSA? I'd like to make a quick one, Gabe. Hey, it's all you, Mike. <clears throat> for those of y'all that are here that might be interested in adding your Part 107 small UAS certificate to your pilot certificate, uh, any flight instructor can typically do it for you that you've normally been working with. But I ran into a problem with a gentleman oh, about two weeks ago and they did their application using an Apple device with the Safari browser. And if you use an Apple device with Safari and try to do an application in IACRA, which is the FAA's electronic 87, well, they don't always play nice together. And I spent over two hours and figured out he has to use Chrome because Apple just doesn't get along well with with the FAA's IACRA system. So save everybody a lot of hassles, pass that on to folks you know, and it'll make processing uh, about a 15 minute deal. And like I said, any flight instructor can do it. Catch me on the weekends at Leesburg and all I really need is, is a, a digital copy, a PDF of your completion certificate because you have to upload that with the application and a driver's license in 15 minutes, you'll walk out of there with another piece of uh, temporary certificate for a piece of plastic. Be, and every, I know Leesburg's about the same. We're, we're happy to help anybody out that way. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you for, for sharing that. That's, that's great. <clears throat> uh, let's see, so we're getting, um, actually, one second here. Give me one second, excuse me. I need to grab the word. Hey, Mark. I'm to see you here. Fresh. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. See, we've got uh, so. Let's see, Luke, Jonathan, Michael, Mark. It's all nice to see all of you. Uh, Jen Weller, I I don't see you, but I see your name there. Um, it was great catching up with you the other day. We could we should do that again sometime. Hey, how are you? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it's great to have everybody again. I mean, like I said. I've shared this probably a few different places. It's uh, we kind of went on a little hiatus on these <laughs> virtual meetings, so uh, I'm glad that everybody was patient to get another one spun up here. Um, and with that said, <clears throat> we actually have a, two more coming this month. One actually on Thursday with Aero Elite, uh, which will be a tail dragger uh, session. And uh, be sure to tune into that one because um, we can. Um, you, you'll learn a ton. I've seen the slide deck and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and then additionally, we will have a, another meeting on, I believe it's the 22nd, 
uh, which will be a fast team event. And Chris and I are working towards uh, getting that all set up. Um, <clears throat> most likely have John Somiak on for a portion or all of that session, uh, which is a maintenance after, uh, it's, is it pre-flight after maintenance, I believe is what it is. So um, if you want to join in on that one, uh, feel free. That'll also be a wings credit course as well. So uh, that is uh, in the pipe. And we have a few other things that we're working on in the background. Chris has found another presenter later this month, I think. And so lots of things going on. So uh, first of all, what I want to say is uh, to Russell Green, um, I got to tell you that this was uh, this particular session uh, was something that he and I have been discussing for some time. And uh, he brought this idea to have Colonel Malone on with us this evening. So everyone on this call, you have to thank Russell for setting this all up because he is the, the mastermind behind and the person that coordinated this. I just happened to throw up a Zoom link. So um, Russell, I want to thank you for doing that. And uh, it's been a lot of fun working with you along the way to coordinate this. So we make a good team, buddy. Um, well, really thanks, Dave. That. I agree with that. And, and I can speak, uh, I can say that for a lot of, um, you know, the other members in the club, we do a, a very good job of coming together and making uh, really nice and amazing things happen for what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that said, um, as always, we'll, we'll go through and, and hear from Colonel Malone. Uh, I'm sure we'll do some Q&A at the end. Um, and if you have anything along the way, I'm, I'm sure we could talk through that. But uh, Russell is going to introduce Colonel Malone for us this evening. Thank you, Gabe. Um, I want to briefly go over um, uh, the Colonel's uh, bio. Um, and again, I want to thank Colonel Malone for being here. Um, we had a great conversation yesterday when um, I gave him sort of a pre-interview for this event. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, Colonel Malone is a very, um, not, he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to aviation, uh, both for military flying and, and the civilian world. And, and to briefly go over his bio, um, Colonel Malone was the Regional Reserve Director for FEMA Region 6. Uh, the reserve advisor to the National Security and um, Emergency Preparedness Directorate of a, um, 1AF and AF North Tyndall Air Base, Florida. He was a, pr a principal Air Force liaison for civil support and homeland security uh, for in support of Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma during disasters and emergencies declared by the president. Uh, Colonel Malone began his Air Force career in 1979 at the Air Force Academy, where he was commissioned um, in 84 and earned his wings in 1985. Um, Colonel Malone flew the C5 T-37 tweet the T3A, T41, the F-15, which I am um, excited about hearing about his experience flying, the AT-38, um, and as well as in the civilian world, flying the um, Mad Dog MD-80, uh, my and also my favorite airliner, the Airbus 319 and 321. And currently he is typed on the Dreamliner, the Boeing 787, Colonel Malone is right now also an adjunct professor at Texas A&M, and um, he is married to the lovely uh, former Rosalind Johnson, and they have two wonderful daughters. One is a doctor, and the other one is serving in the Air Force currently as a captain and um, is also a graduate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, welcome to our event once again, Colonel Malone, and... Um, um, the floor is yours if you have anything that you would like to add to that. All right. Well, that's great. And uh, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, hey, thank you all so very much for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I am uh, actually humbled and uh, uh, very appreciative for the opportunity to uh, uh, share with you just uh, part of uh, uh, my life experiences and um, uh, I know Russell's been saying he's very excited, so uh, I'll just try to live up uh, to the uh, to the bill. Uh, but let me just say I'm, I'm just really thrilled to uh, uh, meet more uh, aviation enthusiasts and people out there uh, who who also share 
the uh, passion for flying and also bringing more people into the, uh, into the family of aviators. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this evening. Um, I, I guess I'll start, I'll just give you a little background uh, information, kind of tell you about uh, my, my journey, my path. Um, I actually was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. And, uh, and I'll give you a little uh, background on that. Um, uh, grew up um, very poor, uh, lived in the inner city of Memphis. Uh, neither uh, my mom or dad graduated from high school. Uh, I have an older sister, about four years older. Um, she was actually the first to uh, attend college in our family. And uh, I was the second out of uh, four kids. We were only two to uh, go to college. Um, and and I, I guess I'm a little bit different because I kind of got the aviation bug a little bit later because um, I really, uh, I was in uh, Army Junior <coughs> RTC in high school. And uh, so I was very interested in the military. Um, but I really didn't know, of, um, didn't really have an interest in a flying career, primarily because uh, I really didn't know about it and um, really hadn't been introduced um, to it. And um, my uh, ROTC instructor in high school um, suggested I apply for a service academy. Uh, I really didn't know anything about uh, service academies other than the fact that I'd heard about Army and Navy, uh, but I really was, I was very uh, just, ignorant to all of that. And uh, so I applied and was accepted into the academy. Um, and for aviation wise, the first um, time I was on an airplane was my ride out to the, uh, to the Air Force Academy from Memphis. First time on an airplane. Um, but uh, then it kind of took off from there. Uh, my first ride really was, uh, we had some orientation rides and uh, gliders, uh, helicopters. And uh, that's when I really kind of started getting the bug. And uh, I really didn't know if I would go into uh, aviation as a pilot because they told me at first my, uh, from medically speaking, um, my eyes weren't good enough uh, for a pilot. I would uh, have to be a navigator. I said, oh, oh well, that's a job, it's something. I'll figure out what that is later. Um, and uh, somehow magically, my eyes got better and I was able to go to uh, undergraduate pilot training, UPT in the Air Force. Uh, went down to Columbus, Mississippi, um, and that was an eye-opener. And, and I share with uh, young people, uh, a lot of kids that I talk with and, and their parents. Um, I went through, I was on a five-year plan at the Academy, uh, Air Force Academy, went to the prep school for the first year, prep, uh, prep school there on campus. And uh, so it took me five years to uh, uh, complete uh, the Academy. And I tell people that um, to that point in my life, uh, five years of the academy. I actually went through basic uh, Army airborne training at Fort Benning, Georgia with the Army. And I tell people without a doubt, the most stressful, the most difficult thing I ever did in my life was going through Air Force pilot training uh, that year at Columbus, Mississippi. Um, you fly either simulator um, once a day, a uh, couple of flights a day, uh, academics, testing, absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And um, uh, we, uh, it was stressful, it was challenging. Uh, we had about, probably about 25%, maybe 30% of our students did not make it through. Um, so uh, it was the real deal. And, um, but I tell you what, when you get the wing, you go, well, wow. Uh, it was absolutely uh, worth it. Um, from there, um, Actually, uh, had done pretty well that year in training. So um, uh, the Air Force asked, <laughs> of course, and uh, uh, and by asking, they told me that I would stay there to be a first assignment instructor pilot, uh, or FAPE is what we call in the uh, Air Force first assignment uh, IP. And so uh, I continue on flying the uh, the T thirty seven as an instructor, uh, the the uh, the T thirty seven tweet. Uh, great flying. And again, so now flying uh, two, three times a day with, air, uh, with new uh, second lieutenants, um, uh, Air Force uh, student pilots. Uh, it was great flying and uh, it was very challenging as an IP, uh, but I, I, again, I, I just kept learning, uh, learning and putting more into my, uh, my hip pocket of, uh, uh, at that point, very young aviation experience. Um, 
let's see, so I stayed there. And um, in that time, I would meet my uh, future wife. Uh, and I met her when I was in training. I was in instructor training. We do the instructor training here at um, Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio. And uh, yeah, there we go, a little bit later. And that's our oldest, uh, that's our 32 year old right there that <laughs> I'm holding. Uh, so that tells you how old that picture is. Um, but I met my future wife here at Randolph. And so uh, we later got married and we came back here to Randolph. And at Randolph, uh, like I said, it's the instructor school. So now I became, um, if you will, an instructor, instructor's instructor. So uh, great assignment, uh, great flying once again. And uh, so everything was looking great. Uh, probably been in the Air Force at that point. Uh, just going on about five or six years and everything was just looking um, just, just wonderful. The whole world's in front of us and just really uh, uh, enjoying my uh, aviation career at that point. Uh, after, as I was uh, coming to the end of my uh, instructor pilot duties there, um, we had to pick another assignment, uh, what we call a major weapon system. So, because uh, at that point, you really couldn't stay in training command and instructor in those type of aircraft, aircraft for your entire career. So I had to pick a, uh, uh, another assignment. And uh, from there, that's when I was uh, um, assigned the uh, F-15. So um, I went through fighter lead-in training out in Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And uh, there we flew the AT-38, which is just kind of a pseudo fighter version of the AT-38, which I've flown as a student uh, a few years prior to that. And um, do that for about three, four months, and then we go off to six months of training in the F-15. Well, like I said, UPT pilot training, initial pilot training was the toughest thing I've done in my life. And now F-15 training was undoubtedly the, uh, the most difficult thing I've done in my life. Incredible airplane, incredible weapon system. Um, it, it just, it, it can do things. Um, and now uh, older, we've actually started, if it's not completely retired uh, here in the States, uh, I know it is flying around in some uh, other countries, uh, but it is a wonderful weapon system. Well, uh, while in that, in training, my uh, career took an abrupt change at that point. Um, once I got to the later phases of training, um, I had all kinds of struggles and uh, did not complete my F-15 training uh, when it came to the uh, advanced fighter maneuvering. Um, I've, uh, I completed really 90% of the training, but that last 10%, uh, I just could not manage within their time frame. And so, uh, and that was, that was a real kicker because uh, I really hadn't struggled uh, up to my in my career in flying and uh and this this was a bear so uh, but the air force says hey you are still a more than qualified pilot it's just this very specific aspect of uh of that airplane uh you cannot master so we're going to give you another assignment and so uh from there i went back into training command um i had got some time in the uh the t-41 again as an instructor uh, which is nothing more than a yeah, Cessna 172, uh, the military version of Cessna 172. Uh, went back and taught student pilots there. And then um, uh, and then we uh, had a little bit of a life crisis um, that uh, required me to um, kind of take about a year's break from flying um, uh, to take care of a um, uh, sick, well, sick family member, sick child uh, who we eventually lost. And um, during that time, they put me in a staff job, and uh, that's where I got my uh, test program experience. And uh, and then when I was when I was over, the Air Force says, "Hey, you, uh, you got to get back in the cockpit." And um, they asked what airplane I want to fly, and I said, "Hey, let's try to C5." And uh, I go, "Yeah, I've, I've flown small, so why not go big?" And uh, so I went to the uh, the C the Lockheed C5. Uh, at that at that time, we had the A, B, and C models, um, and uh, what a great mission! Um, we say it's the world's second. Maybe Russians have really two versions that are two airplanes that are technically bigger than us uh, than C five, but uh, uh, really the world's third largest uh, aircraft, and we flew it everywhere. Um, strategic airlift, so. Um, 
we flew uh, again all over the world, uh, mainly to larger airports, but we taken into some places that, um, I mean, if it had 6,000 feet of runway, uh, we could take that airplane into it. And uh, one of the biggest challenges I, I, uh, I tell people with the C-5, it was, it was great airplane, very capable. Uh, probably the biggest challenge to flying that was just taxiing because uh, air, airports aren't really made for aircraft that big. And so uh, taxiing, you're always on uh, pins and needles and uh, you, just, uh, you, you just took that very slow and very careful uh, maneuver around airports. Um, let's see, I uh, did that. Um, you know, of course, uh, left seat, um, aircraft commander, instructor, evaluator, uh, did that. And then I finished up my active duty uh, time in uh, the Slingsby T3A Firefly. Again, another trainer for basic students. Uh, Semi-acrobatic and a uh, nice little airplane. Um, but we had, uh, uh, unfortunately, we had some troubles in that program and we had, um, we actually uh, lost three airplanes and unfortunately uh, lost uh, six lives, uh, three students and three instructor pilots, um, uh, fatalities. And so uh, the Air Force grounded the airplane after a while. And, um, but if you ever, you can look it up, it's been flying all over the world, a sling speed firefly. Um, but uh, that was, uh, again, just a uh, uh, very uh, difficult uh, time in my aviation uh, career there, just uh, living, through, living through that. Um, at that point, I got off of active duty, uh, came to the Air Force Reserves, got a job with a C-5 reserve unit here, down here in a, in Texas and uh, start flying that again. Uh, and right about the same time, I was also hired by American Airlines. Um, got uh, first airplane there was the, uh, the Mad Dog, Super 80. Love flying that airplane. Uh, you, I mean, you, you have to fly it. It's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, very low tech, if you will. Uh, really no tech compared to some of the airliners coming out now, but what a fun airplane to fly and uh, really enjoyed my experiences there. Uh, later went on to the, uh, to the Airbus. Uh, interesting there, we, at American Airlines, we, we bought new, um, we got new Airbuses. And when I got assigned to it, I was one of the first crews to get assigned to the Airbus. We actually didn't have any um, Airbuses on property. This is also about the time we were merging with US Air and America West. And so, we didn't have any of the 319s and 321s on property. So I went through my initial training on the Airbus, and then I went back to the Super 80. When it got a check ride, and went back to the Super 80 and flew it for about another three months before we got the, uh, the Airbus on property and came back and uh, did that. So it's been about four years on the Airbus, and for the last, um, last about five years or so. Um, yeah, just going on five years now, I've been on the uh, Boeing 787. Um, and I tell you what, it's uh, what an incredible, incredible airplane. Uh, just, you're just talking about, uh, it's just designed so well uh, for, the, uh, for the cockpit, uh, the avionics. Uh, it, it is a, um, uh, it's a just joy to fly the airplane. Um, yeah, we have some long flights, uh, but we're up at, you know, flight level 410, 41,000 feet, and your cabin altitude is maybe six, you know, max is out right around 6,000 feet. So, um, you know, it's, it's what a, just an incredible, incredible uh, aircraft. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of my career in a nutshell. Uh, as I was telling Russell, uh, I've been blessed uh, because coming out of high school, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And, uh, you know, I never had a 10-year plan or anything like that. Um, but uh, the Air Force uh, started and provided me a lot of great opportunities and uh, is continuing on with American Airlines. And uh, I've just really, really enjoyed uh, my, well, really... Um, 36 years now of aviation. And so uh, with that, that's it. And 
I'll throw it back to you, Russell, to uh, if you have any specific questions. Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Colonel, for uh, going over um, your um, 36 years in aviation. Um, more specifically, I wanted to ask, uh, you uh, mentioned something that was very interesting to me. Um, can you go a little more about your, um, your F-15 training, such as when you um, first strapped it in and you ended up going over the speed of sound? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, well, we, uh, absolutely, Air 15 was, uh, uh, and, you know, all these airplanes are just, they're different type of uh, flying, they're different type of missions uh, with the military. And um, so I got to it, and like I said, I had a lot of time at that point in a T-37 um, student and then as an instructor, but that's subsonic. Um, we probably, you know, 250 knots, 300 knots is probably you know, our max we're used to. But I had some time in the uh, T-38 and uh, faster airplane, you're cruising around now three, 400 knots, uh, maneuvering somewhere in there and uh, it's capable of supersonic, but you just, we didn't really do it. It's not really practical. Um, F-15 now, the weapon is a weapon system. Um, it's a big airplane too. And I'm sure uh, a lot of you've seen them at uh, air shows or statics. Uh, it's a big airplane. And but those two powerful engines and uh, man, you, you strap it on and the first time you fly it. Um, yeah, you get used to the speed, but it's also very stable. And of course, then you start maneuvering and uh, pulling the G's, which uh, and let me just tell you, the most of our sorties, most of our sorties were about an hour in duration, a little bit under, actually. And it was a physical and mental workout. Um, when you're maneuvering and doing your practice dog fighting and all that, uh, you're pulling average uh, five to six Gs and it's just, it's very exhausting. And you're having to recall a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, uh, technical uh, information, technique and uh, strategy uh, while you're doing all this under very uh, physical uh, demand. Um, the uh, interesting enough, uh, everyone that gets there, we're, we're all Air Force pilots at that point. So you could be a second lieutenant uh, get into that airplane or or our captain, um, and so you can only be in uh, you maybe in the Air Force a year and a half, two years, or four to five years. Um, you take about four rides with an instructor, three or four rides, and then all the rest of your training is solo. So because uh, you're already a full up pilot, and so you take three or four rides to give you a check ride. And then they clear off solo. And so you're going up there practicing all of your maneuvers and uh, everything, uh, the tactics and all that, uh, you're solo. So you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of experience pretty quick, uh, but it's a powerful machine and uh, a very, uh, is a very capable uh, weapon. And it really is a weapon. So um, when we were talking yesterday, when you were uh, discussing um, you know, the challenges you had towards the end, the, the 10%. And you uh, mentioned, you know, integrating the weapon system to the actual airplane. Could you uh, tell us a little more about that experience? The challenge Absolutely. of integrating the weapon system to the maneuverability of the airplane. Absolutely. So um, you really, the, the basic thing is, first of all, you're learning the airplane and, uh, and all the basic systems, of course, like any airplane that um, we've all flown. Um, and then you start learning the, the weapon systems. Um, one of the big things for the F-15 is its radar and all the capability of its air-to-air uh, -air, uh, radar. And um, that's why there is an F-15 because it's employing that radar to hook up with the armament. And uh, so you go and you know, hunt the enemy or defend yourself against the enemy. Um, so you learn the systems, you learn the weapon systems, and you're still learning uh, basic fighter maneuvers, um, you know, formations, the tactics, uh, you know, what you do in certain situations. Um, and then toward the end, you're putting all of this together. And it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you walk, you learn, is a building block approach. You learn the basics of offensive uh, fighter maneuvers. So if I've got a, a target out there, how do I acquire the target? Um, how do I sort out the target, make sure it's a target that I'm looking for? 
and then how do I maneuver to get in position to employ my various weapons, whether it be long range missile, uh, short range, uh, heat sinking missile, a gun, uh, but all the tactics, tactics that are involved in getting to a position to, uh, to kill, kill the target. Uh, and then you learn uh, defensive. Uh, someone gets a jump on you. Someone's um, uh, locking you up. And um, how do you, what countermeasures do you use? Uh, and let's say all of that fails, and all of a sudden they're back there at, um, at a distance, which we can't say. And all of a sudden now you have to defend yourself, basic uh, or defensive uh, fighter maneuvering. And what are the tactics, what are the techniques you use to defend yourself uh, flying that big, I call it the tennis court um, of an airplane, of a fighter, and you're out there maneuvering at, you know, um, real fast, but not too fast because you want to make sure you're at your best cornering uh, velocity and best uh, maneuverable speed. And so you're just putting all that together in really these little snippets of about two minutes, one to two minute dog fights. And, uh, and, and, that's, and that's a lot, that's, that's a lot of uh, information. Uh, that's a lot of maneuvering, that's a lot of flying. And uh, so, yeah, and, that, and that's what I'm getting to uh, as you kind of build and build and build and put it all together uh, toward the end. So before we move on to uh, other parts of uh, what we have, um, what I would like, to, for you to share with the other members as you shared with me yesterday. Um, as far as F-15 is concerned, um, was the um, unrestricted, the first time you did uh, the unrestricted climb, was that the most, uh, one of the biggest things that stuck out the most to you? Oh my goodness, yeah, it just pure power, just pure power. Uh, that airplane, uh, and you, you got a sense of the first time you fly it, you, you uh, push the throttles up and um, you know, you take off most of the times and in max power, maybe minimum afterburner. Um, when you're dog fighting, you're kind of working in and out of min afterburner, sometimes a little bit more. Because again, you, you really have to control your speed. Uh, you don't want to get too fast and all that. Um, the, uh, but if you put the throttles up, you, you feel the kick in your butt. And that's, that's without, that you know, that's higher power setting, but that's not full afterburner. And so you know it's the airplane's got a lot of power it's fairly instantaneous power and uh and they let us do a little demo ride where we take off uh you can't hold the brakes with afterburner because it's just too much power uh so you put it up to max power you release the brakes and then you just put it into uh somewhere in the afterburner range and then you take off once you lift the ground you put in a full afterburner get just a couple of seconds of speed and you just lift it just right on his tail and you're going pretty much straight up in the air. And uh, I couldn't, I can't remember really the time, but I mean, to get to 20,000 feet, it was just a matter of uh, seconds. And uh, you're just, you're straight, almost pure vertical, still accelerating. It's, uh, it's, it's just incredible uh, amount of uh, power is demonstrating. And uh, you don't do that for a few, little bit because once you do that, you realize, oh man, I got, I, I just burned a third of my fuel. So <laughs> can't do it too long. That's outstanding. Yeah. Um, so you go from the F-15 uh, mm -hmm. back to a, a training squadron. And mm -hmm. then you, so basically you go from a super fast, super powerful, super advanced uh, F-15 to the 172. I'm sure that was a bit of an adjustment. Yeah, I had to slow down a little bit, right? You know, just uh, just a little bit. And um, and I had flown, you know, at that point, uh, all uh, all student pilots in the uh, Air Force, um, you would fly the 172, you'd fly the T-41 in uh, pilot indoctrination. And uh, we had uh, a program at the Academy uh, and also at Hondo, Texas. Um, the uh, The... Squadron at the Air Force Academy were uh, active duty people like myself. Um, the, the squadron at Hondo, Texas was made up of uh, currently civilians. And uh, some of them were retired Air Force, but a lot of them were just, uh, had been just purely uh, civilian pilots. And uh, they checked them out on a T-41. And, uh, and it's really, uh, it was really just the basics of flight. And it's really just kind of, 
you know, get the, that young student, someone off the streets to realize, hey, turn left, turn right, uh, go down, pull back, you go up, pull back for too long, and airplane's going to go down on its own, right? It's going to stall. It was just basic indoctrination to, uh, to flying. Um, it was really fun flying, of course. Uh, we didn't do any type of instrument work uh, with that. Uh, and I tell you, so going back as an instructor, where I now have to really have the opportunity to fly it more and more, and um, it really got me a lot more aware, awareness of general aviation, because we really follow more the general aviation rules. And we were going to uh, airfields that were, you know, uncontrolled. And um, so we had to, you know, here's how you make the calls. Instead of going into a military field, where there's always a tower and controllers and all that. Um, so it was, I tell you, I really enjoyed it. It was really uh, fun flying. And so, uh, and I always, you know, kind of go back to that when I go to the Aero Club and check out a, a 172 and just go flying on my own. Great. Um, <laughs> so, so right now, uh, briefly, I'm going to throw it back to Gabe before I go through the rest of my questions so he can uh, field some of the questions from the members. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so thank you, and thanks for the uh, the great questions, Russell. Um, one of the questions came from Laura, who is uh, online and she is on camera. Uh, Laura, do you want to do you want to ask your question directly? Up, oh, you're on mute. There sure. We go. Hi. Thank you for for talking to us. Um, I, I was just Thank curious you. if you could could uh, talk about what's going on uh, at American Airlines with this whole COVID crisis and and pilot furloughs. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, so it's been a very difficult um, um, period of time for, uh, for all of us, for this country, for this world. And um, in industry, of course, has been, uh, uh, you know, business and industry has just been so impacted. Um, we, um, it, it kind of started early, and I, I really paid attention to this because one of the uh, routes that I will fly on 787, of course, is uh, and I'm based out of Dallas, uh, Dallas Fort Worth. And so one of the routes that I would every once in a while get because it's a very senior route and I'm a little bit, I was a little bit more junior in the airplane, but I would get uh, China. And out of Dallas, we would fly on a 7-8, we would fly to uh, Beijing and uh, Shanghai. And so uh, a lot of, of course, a, a lot of the uh, flight crews are really paying attention to the news as it started coming out of uh, China toward the end of the year and the beginning of this year. Um, so early in this year, um, we stopped uh, flying into China, of course, and, uh, and then uh, I tell you, March 16th um, was really, um, I also, also teach a class up at the uh, schoolhouse, and uh, that week I was training, I was teaching, and so um, uh, I left the schoolhouse on the 16th, and I had I actually had two um, Hawaii trips in a month, and both of those were canceled. So we had started going through the, uh, uh, of course, the lockdown, you know, mid mid March, and uh, and of course we started uh, uh, canceling flights. Um, I'd gotten my schedule for the next month, for the month of month of April, and I think I was holding, uh, I think Madrid um, for the month of April. And even before the end of March, like all of those were canceled. Um, so what did we do? Um, you know, really the flying shut down. So we really kind of shut down. One of the things we did, um, the airline recognized we we're going to have too many flight crews. Um, so, uh, so I'll speak to the pilots. Uh, even one, one April, before, uh, before April started, American offered uh, leave of absence packages. Uh, for the pilots, one, three, or six month, one, three, six month uh, packages. This is at reduced pay, about 75% pay. And, um, and uh, I request, personally, I requested a, uh, one of those packages. You have to bid for anything you want, so I bid for all three. And I didn't expect, I, would, I was thinking I might get a one or three month, and unfortunately, I've got a, uh, a six month uh, leave of absence. So uh, even though my schedule had canceled for April, uh, I, I officially went on leave of absence, uh, paid leave starting one uh, April. 
and I'm scheduled to go back one October. Uh, actually, last week, uh, I was up at the uh, schoolhouse to go through refresher training, uh, take off and landings. Um, what, that's one of the things we have to do is when you're on the leave, any type of scheduled training that comes up, you have to comply with. So in May, I had my recurrent training. Um, so I went to that for a week, hours is three days. And then uh, just this past week, I went up for takeoff and landings and uh, expect to go back here uh, one, uh, one April. So a couple of weeks ago, we announced um, our first and hopefully only uh, round of furloughs for pilots. And uh, one, one person losing their job is too many anywhere. And, um, but we announced 1,600 pilots. Uh, when all this started, we had uh, 14, about 14,700, if I'm not mistaken, 14,007. Uh, we announced 1,600 uh, over October, November, December. Um, we had about 800 pilots take a early retirement that was offered for 62 and older. Um, so we had about 800 of those uh, take that. So, uh, and over the next few years, we still have a lot of just, uh, just regular retirements because our average age, if I'm not mistaken at American, average age for pilots is about 53. So we're gonna average a bunch of retirements. I, I wanna say five to 600 over the next like four or five years. So uh, the, uh, we're gonna have just a lot of natural uh, attrition there. So, um, so that's where we stand for, uh, for the pilots. Uh, our flight attendants have really been, um, well, they, they've had like, um, I wanna say they announced 8,100 furloughs, 8,100. They had 26,000 on, on the books. And I think another 6,000 are taking early retirement. So over half our flight attendants will be gone starting uh, October. So it's just been, uh, I think we have a total of uh, 19,000 uh, furloughs for the company out of 135,000 employees. So uh, it's been devastating. But like I said before, it's been devastating for uh, the whole country. And uh, so uh, we're hoping, uh, our CEO just spoke at the end of August, and uh, he's hopeful that these furloughs will not last past uh, really next, next May. Uh, and hopefully there'll be an uptick in traffic, uh, especially with the uh, next summer coming along. So, uh, uh, so hopefully uh, that answers your question and uh, not getting too long-winded, but. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think that's similar to what the other airlines are doing, that 75% package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. Kind of, I think they all kind of had a meeting of the minds and uh, doing what they can. So thank you for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, and Colonel Malone, just so that you know, Laura is a captain at uh, United. And she actually gave oh, okay. a, a talk with us, I don't know, two or three months ago, was it? Yeah, um, and it, so it, <laughs> yeah it's crazy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm glad that you two could connect. That's great. Oh, um, very cool. What, what yeah, equipment you. are you on, Laura? And where are you at? Uh, A320 out of Dallas. OK, very good. Yeah, yeah. Love the Airbus. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really sad with the COVID situation. I mean, I just got a text today, you know, from a member of the club who was on the fast track, went into the airlines, and he just got furloughed this afternoon, um, maybe yesterday. Um, so it's just devastating to see what's going on, um, to your point. Um, I have somebody on the, and, and before I turn it back over to you, Russell, with some further questions, anybody else have any questions here? Or uh, I have one in my mind, but I want to save it um, if mm -hmm. I can. Anybody else have any So this, this question is for, uh, I'm gonna, I guess, frame this for uh, a person who's on the call at the moment. Um, her name is Nicole. She's learning how to fly out of Leesburg. Mm -hmm. And what, I'm, what I would love to ask you is, you know, knowing full well what you've shared with us, all the challenges and, and everything, <laughs> and just kind of, you know, getting your way into the, to flying, what would your, be your biggest point of advice for her as she's going through her training right now? Okay. Um, first of all, enjoy it. <laughs> I mean, um, sometimes we can kind of get bogged down, um, you know, as we go later on into it, um, uh, into the work aspect of it, into the training aspect of it. Um, 
And it is, it's hard work and uh, training is hard. Training is uh, stressful. So I would say first uh, embrace it and just uh, enjoy it. Uh, I just, I tell you, I'm, I, I fly, even when I fly today, I'm sitting there, I'm looking out the window. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing and, and thanking God that, you know, I'm getting paid to do this and, and going to, you know, great places, uh, things like that. Um, but, but then also more tangible, uh, uh, more tangible, you know, uh, get involved in, in organizations like this. Uh, grab another pilot and, and ask questions um, and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about. Um, uh, this is what, this is the route I want to go. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Um, you know, talk about, you know, hey, here's, I'm coming up for this rating. Um, what should I look for? Um, I, I know, especially from military background, um, and, and I found out even on the commercial civilian side, I mean, knowledge is, is king, and there are there's so many pilots who are willing to share information. Um, and it, I mean, it goes from anything from a check ride into, hey, how do, you know, once you're an established uh, pilot uh, in a company, hey, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a uh, Czech airman. Uh, how do I do that? Um, so ask questions, um, get a mentor, um, and let that person try to uh, guide you and give you um, the knowledge uh, that you can kind of keep in your back pocket and go, oh, okay, I remember they told me I should be doing this maybe around this time frame, or don't forget to do this. Um, so really the big thing is just, I, I think is, uh, knowledge, uh, enjoy what you're doing, and, and don't give up the passion. Don't give up the dream. Um, like I said, I, I guess I'm a little bit weird because um, I, I wasn't that, that person when I was young to have that 10-year plan. And so I guess I look back on it and go, man, maybe I lucked into some things. Uh, but I always just figured, hey, I'm going to work hard and, um, you know, let's go do this. And, and uh Every time I went to training, I just I, I put my heart and soul into it uh, because I knew it was an opportunity and I knew it was going to be tough. So um, just just go in, uh, just just jump in all the way to the hip and get muddy and just uh, put everything you can into it. And uh, it's definitely worth it. But uh, another thing, too, is the world is short on pilots right now. And um uh, we're going to need young aviators. And so uh, it's imperative that we're reaching out to young people like Nicole and others to, uh, to say, hey, let's, let's get into this. And uh, you can do this because they really can. And uh, guess what? They're going to need to, you know, I've got, you know, less than six years left now. And so I need Nicole to be flying me to Hawaii lately, later. So we need a replacement. Thank you for that. I, I, I love that. And uh, there's a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure where that's at, but um, I really, really appreciate that. And I love your point about the mentor. Uh, this is actually something that uh, Ryan on the call, who uh, just texted me today and said, hey, you know, there's an idea I have around mentorship. And so you, it's it, what, a, what a weird, ironic thing that you just said, because it's exactly, I think, what a lot of people need. So thank you for that answer. Um, absolutely. absolutely appreciate it. So Russell, all of you, buddy. Uh, thank you, Gabe. And, um, and, um, and I'm also glad that, um, you know, Laura and, um, and uh, Colonel Malone were able to connect on here, um, especially uh, since they both flew my favorite airliner, the Airbus. Um, <laughs> and what's, what's the great segue to my next question. So um, what was it, what was your experience like transitioning from you know flying in the military to the civilian world if you could go over a little bit about that a little bit oh okay um it was uh for me it was a i thought a very seamless transition um because it's really more the type flying that you're doing and um like i said once i you know, uh, flying the T-37, T-38, F-15, uh, even the T-41 and T-3, you know, that's, 
at most you have two people in the airplane doing that. So that's that little airplane, you know, fighter mentality. A lot of times I flew those airplanes solo. Um, so, you know, you didn't really have to think about crew uh, resource management and uh, crew communications too much. Uh, with a student, of course, now, you know, you have that student uh, instructor uh, relationship that, uh, that you absolutely have to, uh, to think about and develop. Um, but really, when I transitioned to the C5, and now you're dealing with an actual crew, um, most of the times we went out, the minimum crew was uh, four, uh, two pilots, and we had, on every flight we actually had to have two flight engineers. Uh, one, because since the airplane was so big, one of the flight engineers was actually outside the aircraft down there, um, kind of where I'm standing and around the aircraft it's to monitor for engine start and, uh, and all that. So, uh, and they have some other duties they do post start, and then they come into the aircraft close the door. And uh, then they sit a uh, uh, side panel with the other engineer and they trade off uh, engineer panel duties. Um, but that's the, the bare minimum crew. When we went operational, most of the times we went with three pilots, two engineers, and then we had the load masters in charge of uh, the cargo and the uh, and any uh, passengers that we had on board. So operationally, my, my crew would be anywhere from 10 to, I had a crew of 23 people uh, on a couple of missions, 23. I uh, had a lot of load masters. We had a couple of uh, crew chiefs uh, because of some of the places we were going that, uh, and guess what, an airplane that big um, tends to have mechanical issues. Um, so some of the places you went to, you didn't necessarily want to break down so uh, we take a crew chief or two with us to some of the places. So yeah, I've had crews of uh, uh, 19, 20, and, uh, and I want to say a couple of times it was 23 people. Um, and so that's when you really learn the crew concept and crew management and all that. And, uh, and I tell you, I loved it. Uh, I, I love flying with crews. Um, so I think that really helped me transition uh, to the airlines because, you know, once you get to the airlines, you're learning to fly whatever airplane you're mm -hmm. on. And then you're learning, you know, company procedures and how to uh, navigate. Um, um. Now, I will tell you, it was a transition uh, going from flying into uh, bases like Travis Air Force Base, and then I fly to San Francisco International. Okay, <laughs> it's very different. Um, because military bases, military ramps are really, uh, it, it's kind of, well, let's just say it's not as busy. There's not as much activity going on. And, you know, first time I was on a, uh, on a uh, civilian ramp at DFW or Chicago or here, I'm going, why are those people just driving around in all those trucks and pickups and tugs and holy crap, they're like ants out there. Uh, so it really took me back for a second. Um, but working with crews and the uh, other pilot, uh, I, I think the, uh, the C5 especially really, uh, prepared me for that. And, uh, it, it was kind of a seamless transition. Well, uh, speaking of transitions, yes, yes. um, as we discussed yesterday, um, you, you briefly mentioned the mad dog, um, which is sort of like, you know, a cult favorite within the airline industry for pilots that have flown it. Um, could you tell us a little about your experience when you first um, operated that uh, aircraft? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, again, being an older aircraft and you, you did not have the, um, I would say the, uh, the technological advances of, uh, well, you know, you look at some of the airplanes now like the Airbus or the, uh, the Dreamliner and, you know, the switches, most of the switches you have in the cockpit uh, above your head, uh, down by it, I mean, they're controls, um, you know, whether it be, you know, anything from radar or, okay, windshield wipers and all that. Uh, MD-80, you know, you had all the, all the gauges and the dials from, okay, you know, what's, you know, what's my electrical lo uh, load reading? And, and 
you know, you have like two, I think two different switches to start the airplane and, and all, and then circuit breakers everywhere, you know, like the uh, 787, um, 787, our, our circuit breakers are, are virtual. You know, we go inside the multifunction display to access the circuit breakers. You know, if we do that at all, really, because there's not too many times our maintenance, uh, our, uh, our checklist abnormal procedures are gonna have us even play with circuit breakers, okay? Um, so the MD-80 was just, um, it, it was a little bit, I call it old school. And, um, but, but really it was the flying because you know now you really have to think about um hey you know the uh you know like airbus it'll figure out hey you need to start your descent right now it's got a pretty little display <laughs> and all that right and uh md80 was like mm, you got to figure all that out yourself you know it's like oh where's that three to one rule and let me add i got some tailwind let me add about 20 miles for that and you know uh and then flying it itself, I mean, you felt the airplane and that was beautiful. You actually, you know, felt because it had, you know, it had cables and, and pulleys and all that. And um, you, uh, so you actually had to maneuver the airplane around there and uh, you had to uh, stay on top of it, stay ahead of it. And uh, to me, it was just a really fun, uh, uh, fun way of flying a commercial uh, airliner. And, uh, and the other airplanes, of course, are, are, are great too, uh, but they're different. And now you're relying a little bit more on uh, technology. And uh, now going from the 80 to the Airbus was a huge transition because now, guess what? And I'm, when I did that, I was 50, 50 plus. And so now you got a kind of old dude, got to learn technology. And uh, the Airbus is, has a lot of technology. And, um, and you start talking about the flight management system and you really have to, okay, hey, is, is the box updated? Um, uh, and, am I keeping up with that? Uh, am I listening to it? And am I interpreting information correct? So, uh, and also the Airbus, but then, you know, Airbus also is a very slick aircraft too. So uh, you really have to energy manage and, and uh, things like that. So. Uh, that, now, that was a huge transition, just uh, the technological advance of going from something, the, uh, the Super 80, um, to, the Air, to a new Airbus. Um, but it was great. Challenging, but, uh, but, but a lot of fun. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Um, sorry, one second here. Um, I don't know where that's coming from. But So one of the things that uh, has been discussed in the group before is, you know, we you know, you, you see all these pictures that we all post and, you know, great cockpits and tons of technology and, you know, just all the bells and whistles in some of these new aircraft. And so the question that I have is, how do you manage that technology in the aircraft and balance out that with safety? And really, what would be a number one thing or, you know, two or three things that all of us as, as pilots can remember to not get enamored by this technology that's in the cockpit? Like, how do you keep yourself in a safe position with that? Oh, great question. And the analogy I put is, um, I remember hearing a story of, uh, you know, uh, anyone ever flown to, uh, flown into uh, LAX or, um, uh, well, you know, heck, Dallas even, uh, DFW, you know, we have the parallel runways and, uh, you know, you're coming in, traffic permits where, you know, you might be lined up for a one eight right coming into Dallas, uh, DFW. And no one's waiting for takeoff on one eight left. And they say, hey, um, why, don't you, uh, why don't you sidestep? You got one eight left for landing. The tendency is, especially on a new aircraft with all the bells and whistles and those, these great flight management systems and flight management computers, you want to go heads down and start, oh, let me program the ILS and blah, 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 all this into the computer. How about look outside, point the aircraft over there, Go back to your three to one, you know, and we all remember the old, you know, one of the things we did uh, in the T-37 is like put the beer can on the dash. That's where you want to put the uh, landing threshold, uh, things like that. So you, you kind of have to uh, really uh, discipline yourself. I want to go with the basics, understand the basics. If I get to all the technology in a case like that, that's great if I have the time for it. 
but don't let that become your focus because now that'll, that'll get you behind a power curve and that can get you into a lot more trouble. Um, just look out. Um, hey, look, that's, that's a good glide path, right? I got the gear, I got the flaps, checklist complete, let's land. And I don't have to have the box program. You know, turn it off if you have to, if it starts squawking at you, right? So yeah, so you just have to, uh, and I think that's through, but it's through experience. And um, one of the things when I got to the Airbus, they said, learn the technology first, uh, because a lot of tendency is, uh, you might want to say, oh, just give me the visual, and you click off everything and, uh, and go land. But there are certain situations in Airbus where um, it's not that simple. And if you keep levels of uh, automation up, it can actually give you not the information that you want, and it can actually be more distracting to you. So, uh, uh, but it does come with experience. And like I said, when all else fails, just look out, point the airplane where you want to and rely on your, your experience and your uh, instincts. Got it, thank you. Thank you. That was a great question, Gabe. Um, and speaking of technology, um, can you uh, go over what we talked about yesterday with, uh, we discussed the Neo engines that are on a lot of the newer 321s. Uh, can you uh, tell us about your experience with those? Oh, um, I left the 320, uh, 321 before we got the Neo, um, so I have no experience with that, um, with the uh, with the newer engines. Um, the um, I'm trying to remember how many how many Neos we even have in American, but uh, unfortunately, I have zero experience with uh, uh, with that. All right. And finally, my last question is, which is something we talked about a lot yesterday, was diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, can you um, tell us a little bit about your experience with diversity um, through both your military and civilian career in aviation, along with ways that we can improve diversity in the, in the industry? Okay. Um, as we all know, I mean, look at the look at the presentation on here. Um, think about when you've walked into uh, maybe an FBO. Um, I had a friend here in San Antonio who uh, had a Mooney, and uh, he was nice enough to invite me a couple times flying, and we go, you know, to a you know fly in or whatever on a weekend, and uh, and it was a lot of fun and stuff, and. Uh, uh, and I remember going to one up here at the uh, New Braunfels Airport, uh, just uh, north and east of San Antonio. And, uh, you know, bright and early one Saturday morning, walk in. It's probably about 12 people in the uh, FBO. They're having uh, pancakes or whatever. And I walk in, everybody stops, they look at me. And uh, this one old guy looks up and just goes, okay, who invited the Irish? You know, it's... Uh, and, you know, it was one of those things where, yeah, it, it just, it looked different. You know, I was uh, the only uh, black person in the room. And uh, I looked throughout my career. Um, I would say for my, um, I want to say for my like uh, 20, probably about 22 years, 23 years of flying in, in flying organization in the Air Force, um, I probably had a total of about five years where I where I was not the only black uh, pilot in the uh, in the organization. Uh, in November, I hit my 22nd anniversary with American Airlines, and so out of coming upon 21, 22 years, 22 years of flying at American Airlines, I've flown a total of seven days with another black pilot. Um, I would say flying with a female pilot uh, at American is probably about the same, maybe maybe ten days. Um, you know the so it, it's been you know uh, I'm a minority. I think females, uh, you know, we're minorities. It's just not a diverse, real diverse group right now, um, and that's for a lot of reasons. Uh, Probably one of the, the, the big things, especially in the civilian round, it's just so dang expensive, you know? And I doubt very seriously uh, if I would be in aviation today, uh, but not for the military. 
Um, so uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of reasons why um, you don't see a whole lot of diversity um, uh, in, in the pilot ranks. Um, the, uh, so it's imperative that uh, one of the things, like I said, the first time I was on the airplane was when I was, uh, what, 17, going to 18 years old, flying from Memphis to the Air Force Academy. And um, one of the things is just, we just reach out to all young people um, and uh, let have, it, it's so important that they know that this is a uh, career uh, opportunity. Uh, if you want to do it as, as, a, uh, as a career, or if you just want to do it for the pleasure of it, this is something that you can do. It's a passion that you can also be uh, involved with. Um, I had a general officer tell me, this is probably about, uh, I want to say about uh, 15 years ago or so, um, while I was still in the reserves. And, um, and he said, you know, um, it was uh, one period, probably about five years, 10 years before that. So going back 20, 25 years in the Air Force, that there are fewer black pilots then. This would have been in the you know, late 90s to 2000s. More, there are fewer black pilots then than post-World War II and the Tuskegee Airmen. And that blew me away. And, uh, and I started thinking about it. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm flown with many uh, minority uh, pilots. And, uh, and again, a lot of it is just, oh, they don't know about the career. Uh, it's too expensive to get into it. Uh, maybe just think it's something they can't do, but, uh, but they can. Um, so, you know, fast forward. Uh, I've been very, I've been very, very uh, pleased with um, the efforts that American Airlines has been making. They've, uh, they've taken um, recruitment very, very seriously. I know um, years ago they would go to the, uh, we would have the Tuskegee Airmen um, and uh, OBAP, uh, Organization of Black Airline Professionals, uh, those conventions. They would always send a contingent of pilots to that for recruitment. I know they send a contingent of pilots to the women in aviation uh, uh, seminars and, and conventions. Um, they've been very, and, and actually they've reached out to me. Um, I've had some supervisors reach out to me asking uh, input uh, recently, I would say over the last few years about uh, recruitment. Um, they take it very seriously. and. Um, I think those efforts will uh, will pay off. And my thing is, uh, we have a lot of qualified individuals out there, a lot of eager individuals out there, and it goes beyond race, religion, uh, gender, all that. So uh, I just want I want good people out there working with me, and later I want good people out there taking care of my family when they fly. So. All right, well, that concludes all of my questions, uh, Colonel Malone, and um, I'll throw it back to Gabe for um, any other questions with, uh, with the group. Great. Well, um, Colonel Malone, thank you very much for that insight, and, and I totally agree with you in that we have to do a better job, I think, as a collective to connect people to aviation regardless of any other thing, and that's the common ground, and how do we do that? And I got to tell you that the way that uh, I, I think Smokehouse has been growing over the past few years, I'm hoping that we can help uh, achieve those types of things because I think that's very important. And so I appreciate your insight there. And thank you very much. And, and if I can add on to that too, um, uh, I don't know if everyone's aware of, now this is pre-COVID of course, and everything's been put on hold, uh, but we had, a, uh, we had a recruitment tool, a very powerful one, uh, in the, uh, I believe it was called the uh, American Airlines uh, Flight Cadet Program. And, uh, and basically they're taking people off the street and, um, and they would send them through uh, getting their, uh, all their ratings. And the goal is to make them a commercial airline pilot. And the hope is that they will get, at that point, the job is not guaranteed to them, but the hope is that, hey, 
uh, they're going to feel the loyalty and their loyalty is going to be with American Airlines and they're going to want to get to within the uh, American Airlines uh, system. Uh, you start with uh, Envoy and then uh, move their way up uh, to mainline uh, American. So uh, it is a great program. We had tons of applicants, uh, but if you go to, um, I, I want to say American Airlines pilots, you, you can Google it. Uh, I apologize, I don't have that right down the tip of my tongue, um, but they'll talk about it. And of course, right now it's sus suspended. But, um, and I'm pretty sure, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think United and other airlines have very similar uh, programs, but those are powerful, those are powerful uh, avenues. And uh, uh, young people, oh, I say young, but we have some people who are, you know, 40 years old get into that, you know, so. Uh, you know, that's young to me still, but uh, uh, I think that's a wonderful uh, opportunity. No, that's that's fantastic. And what I'll do is I'll find the um, the information for that, and I can share it around with the group on Facebook and things like that. Um, so thank you for for letting us know that. So uh, any other questions before I I wrap us up here from from the group? Anybody that would like to comments, questions, concerns? Cool. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. I, um, Colonel Malone, I was in Air Force as well as you, uh, and uh, graduated about the same time as you. Oh, um, really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, anyway, and that's what I—that's what I flew right there. Uh, oh, outstanding! <laughs> but uh, I like—I like that you brought up uh, strapping on the airplane versus strapping in the airplane. My T thirty-seven instructor had told me that. What do you tell people the difference? Very, very good question. And, uh, and I do say that you strap on because um, the way I've, and it might sound hokey, uh, but uh, you know, I felt that any time that uh, I sit in an airplane, that airplane is really an extension of me. I am part of it. And, um, you have to, you really have to have the mindset of having total control of what you're doing with that aircraft. It is a part of you. So yeah, you strap in on, just like you strap on a net case uh, T-37, um, you know, B-1 or F-15, you strap on your parachute. Uh, some airplanes you, uh, you know, you have your uh, G-suit, you strap that on because that is part of you. And um, like I said, you just want to be, you want to always be in control of what you're doing with that aircraft and think mentally, I want to stay ahead of what I'm doing and uh, always be ahead of the aircraft. But it is absolutely part of you and, uh, um, you know, just, just control it. Uh, and like I said earlier too, uh, when you strap it on and then enjoy it, um, do what you will with it. So, good question. That's great. Great question, Michael. <clears throat> so, what I want to do is I want to uh, just say thank you again, Colonel Lone, for number one, your service, and for all of your insight and expertise, um, and also for sharing uh, an evening with us. We, we absolutely appreciate it. And uh, maybe one day we can cross paths at an airport somewhere or, <laughs> or, or some, some, some sort of connection there. So, I, I would love to do that. But, um, if you were to leave us with the, the top three things to remain as a, a, a safe and efficient pilot in, in the world we're in today, do you have a top three that you can share with us as we close out? Um, I would say first, um, always respect uh, this profession. Um, and, and, and I use that word profession because um, whether you're doing it uh, as a job, uh, you're hired from whatever company, uh, or you're just, or if you're flying on the weekends, um, you know, you grab a 172 or a Mooney, you just, you just want to fly from point A to point B, um, be professional. Um, you know, know, know your aircraft, uh, know the flight rules, know the operating rules, um, 
be, pre be uh, prepared, know the weather. Um, the, um, and they just, just plan. So when you approach uh, flying, uh, approach it uh, professionally. And um, I, say, I, I think, uh, I just think your time, uh, like when I go to the schoolhouse for recurrent or even takeoff and landings, it's supposed to be, of course, no threat or low threat or whatever. It's like, no, it's, you know, I take it very seriously. And um, because I really, um, I put a lot into this and I want to continue to put a lot into it. Um, I would say that's probably uh, the, the biggest. Um, I would say too is, and I brought this up before, uh, enjoy it. Um, you know, it's, you know, sometimes we can kind of get down, you know, into a rut, into a routine. And uh, I know Laura might, <laughs> uh, can understand this. You're going, man, I got a five leg day or something, or you're going, hey, I got this, uh, we, got, we got to fly this 10 hour leg somewhere or whatever. Um, but you know, a, a lot of people will give their right or left arm to be uh, on that flight deck and to uh, and be doing what you're doing. So uh, I just say really uh, enjoy it, embrace it. And uh, so that's two. Uh, three, um, just um, help someone. Um, I know I've received a lot of help and uh and assistance and mentoring um and uh, i think we we owe it uh to the to younger folk and that can be and that can be children uh but you know pay it forward yeah just help someone bring them up and uh, and help them gain that passion for what we do um because it i i just i feel so blessed about it so yeah, great question, Gabe. Thank you. And I, and I love the top three. Those, those are amazing. So <laughs> thank you. Well, if, if no one has anything else, uh, any comments they'd like to share with Colonel Malone, I'd love to um, wrap it up and just remind everybody that, uh, again, Russell, thank you for coordinating this this evening. Uh, and I really appreciate your help. Um, so and looking forward to it again. But uh, thank you, Russell. Well, well, thank you, Gabe, and the rest of the members for uh, making, helping all of this come together. Um, I can't, I don't think it's just one person that makes these things um, a success. I think it's an effort by everyone, uh, you know, to make these things, you know, as uh, valuable as they are. Absolutely. It does take a team. So uh, what I want to do is remind everybody again, like I said at the beginning, uh, Thursday, we will have a, uh, a session with Aero Elite and Tailwheel uh, training. Um, so I hope you can join us there. Um, just to point out, that is a 6 p.m. call versus a 7 p.m. call. It's 6 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, I hope you can join us on that. But uh, with that said, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Colonel Malone, thank you so much. And safe travels out there. And everyone else, be safe as well. Thank you, guys. Thank, all right. thank all of you. Thank appreciate you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Thanks. God bless. Thanks, Bye -bye.